Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the program. The Apostle Paul concluded the book of 2 Corinthians by saying, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. On today's program, we're going to look at what it means to commune or to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. The Trumpet Daily. That verse I mentioned at the top of the program, by the way, is the only verse in Paul's writings that lists God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit together. And the Holy Spirit, as I said at the top, is mentioned in the context of communion or fellowship, not as a third distinct being in the Godhead. If anywhere we could find scriptural support for the so-called Trinity doctrine, you would think it would be found somewhere in the writings of the Apostle Paul. He's the most prolific writer in the New Testament. And instead, we find numerous scriptures in Paul's writings and throughout the New Testament proving without a doubt that God is a family. It's not a trinity of beings. It's a family of beings. You have God the Father, Christ the Son, the Bride of Jesus Christ, children of God, sons of God. It's all through the Bible. The Holy Spirit is not a separate entity inside of a so-called trinity that actually shuts mankind out of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is what the Bible defines it to be, the power of God, or the power of the highest, as it says in Luke chapter 1. And God's Word says that we have to get to know or commune with that power. We have to fellowship with that power. We'll begin our study today in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, get your Bible please and, and read along with me and see what God has to say on this crucial subject, a little understood subject. If you think about the confusion that there is in the world today, particularly in the world of, of religion, the Christian religion, well, this subject on the Holy Spirit, it has to be one that most people are confused on. This is 1 John 4 and verse 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So God says that we better know when something comes from Him or when it doesn't. And again, when you think of what the Bible says about the whole world, including the world of religion, Revelation 12, 9 says the whole world is deceived. And so we're going to have to really know the Spirit in order to know what's of God and what isn't of God, to know what's the truth of God and what isn't. What's biblical and what isn't? It says that we should know the Spirit. And then it goes on and says, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come, or is coming, it should read, in the flesh, is of God. Every person that confesses this or that understands this, Jesus Christ coming again in the flesh. And when that happens, well, it changes your life. Whereas my father says in this book, it revolutionizes your life. When God's Spirit comes into our lives, when Jesus Christ is able to live again in our flesh, that causes quite a revolution. 1 John chapter 5, one page over, and uh, verse 5, it says here, Who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God, that's uh, verse 5 of the next chapter. And then down in verse 12, it says, He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son of God has not life. See, only when Christ is living in us do we have life. He has to come again in our flesh. And that's what we use the Holy Spirit for, so that He can live in us. If you're communing with the Spirit of God or the power of God, 
That's how Christ can live in our flesh. I mean, this is an earth-shaking truth that few people on earth today even understand. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 17. Acts, Acts 17, and, and we'll look at uh, verse 27. Notice, in your own Bible, get your Bible and read along. These are, these are fundamental scriptures. And in fact, let me just give you a quote first from, from uh, Herbert Armstrong. This is from his book, Which Day is the Christian Sabbath, where he says, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Jesus Christ lives today. Okay, we know about the death of Christ. We know about the resurrection. But how many know about Jesus Christ as the living Christ and what he's been doing since that resurrection? He's alive. And Mr. Armstrong says, Why then is Christ pictured either as a helpless babe in his mother's arms, glorifying the mother even ahead of Christ? That's what you see pictured during the time of Christmas, which is not in the Bible. I just have to tell you the truth on that. It's not in the Bible. Nowhere does the Bible command us to observe Christmas. And it says here, why then do people picture him as a helpless babe or else hanging dead on a cross? Jesus Christ is alive today for more than 1,900 years. He has, been, he has been the living head and high priest of the true church, which he built. He is alive. The Bible says he's the head of the church. He says he ser- it says he, he serves as our high priest, our advocate. And so he's active He's alive. We can go to the Father in our prayers through Jesus Christ. Read the end of Hebrews 4 sometime. What an inspiring passage that is about our prayers and the royal environment that our prayers enter into with God the Father and Jesus Christ on the throne of God in the third heaven. It's a wonderful truth. And yet, look at the, as Mr. Armstrong brings out there, look at the counterfeit that Satan has propped up in this world today and the hundreds and hundreds of millions of people who are deceived, carrying on, either celebrating the the birth of Christ or the resurrection of Christ, and really having no understanding of the position and the responsibilities of the living Christ right now, and how that Jesus Christ can live in us through the Spirit, This is Acts 17, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. So we have certainly an important role to play here as well. And Luke brings that out here in Acts 17. We have to seek the Lord. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. With respect to the Spirit, there's a verse in Acts 5, verse 32, that says, You receive the Spirit of God if you obey His commandments. God gives His Spirit to those who obey. And over in Romans 8, the Apostle Paul in verse 14 says that as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. You see, family. But we have to be led by the Spirit. The Spirit's not going to force us. We have to follow. We have to be led, as it says there. But if you seek after it, then notice the next verse, verse 28 says, For in Him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. For in Him, in Jesus Christ, we live. You see, Jesus Christ lives. And we can certainly thank the Father that He does the God who raised him from the dead, who raised him to eternal life in the family of God. Let's just notice one more passage here before we, before we break. This is Romans chapter 5, Romans 5 and, and verse 8. Notice what it says over here. Verse 8 says, But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him, being now justified. I mean, we can be reconciled to the Father because of the death of Christ. We can be justified or made right before God because of that death, upon repentance, of course. But then it goes on and says, they they shall be saved. The tense changes to the future. Verse 10 continues. 
It says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. There's much more that God's working out here below than to just reconcile us to the Father. We shall be saved, it says. That's what your Bible says, Romans 5.10. We shall be, that's future, future tense. We shall be saved by the life of Jesus Christ, the living Christ. He's the author and the finisher of our salvation. You can read about that in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 2 and Hebrews 12. We look to Him. We follow Him. 1 Peter 2 says to follow in His steps. He set a perfect example for us when He lived in the flesh. And now He lives today in spirit. This great, majestic spirit being at the right hand of God. And that being can live, can actually live in the life of a true Christian who understands these truths, who's come to God in repentance and faith, who's been baptized and received the Holy Spirit. Well, there's much more that we can get into with, uh, with respect to this study, but for now, let me just refer you again to the last hour. This is by my father, Gerald Flurry. There's a chapter in here, chapter 2, how Christ is coming again in the flesh. Christ coming in the flesh, just like we read about over in uh, 1 John 4, uh, this chapter, along with all the rest in this book. I think it's 120 pages or so, but a fantastic study. If you're looking to get into, in, in particular, the epistles of John, they're at the end of the, the New Testament. But with respect to what we're covering today, as I say, chapter 2 in particular really does flesh out this, this subject in quite a lot of detail. So you can uh, call our operators today and ask for the last hour or also ask for our, our news magazine, Prophecy in the News. I mean, this helps you understand your world. This helps you understand the, the real significant events and where they're leading in this world today. We send you a free one-year subscription to this magazine. If you'd like one, we'll give it to you free of charge. So stay tuned, take down all the information that you can, and make sure you call us today for the free literature. We'll be right back. How can you know whether a message is truly coming from God? God says we must be able to know when something is from God and when it is not. In the first century, the Apostle John wrote, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Take the analogy of a counterfeit note, for instance. How can you detect a counterfeit note? You can't, unless you know exactly what a genuine note looks like. The same is true of God's Spirit. The only way to detect a full spirit is if you profoundly know God's Holy Spirit. Contrary to the belief of mainstream Christianity, the Holy Spirit is not the third personage of the so-called Trinity. The Holy Spirit is exactly what the Bible defines it as, the power of God. And God offers this power as the greatest gift in the universe to repentant individuals. How do you come to know what this power is? Request today's free book offer, The Last Hour, to find out. Chapter 2 of this book specifically addresses these all-important questions about the Holy Spirit. Be sure to also request a free one-year subscription to our magazine, The Philadelphia Trumpet. This magazine analyzes world events through the lens of Bible prophecy. If you're already a subscriber, you can renew your subscription for another year free of charge. In his autobiography, Herbert W. Armstrong reflected on the small beginning of God's work way back in the 1930s. He said, what man could start out without money, without support or, or backing, without any car even. He had to, to walk or hitchhike back then. What man could start out with a, an unpopular message at that? 
a message that so many people in this world today are hostile toward. What man could expect to get that message preached and published to millions upon millions of people on, on continents all over the world? Because that's what happened. You can read about that story, of course, in his autobiography. But God doesn't want us to forget the small beginning, the mustard seed beginning back in the 1930s. I mean, that also was the time of the Great Depression. What a miracle. What a miracle, the work that God did through Herbert Armstrong. Well, Mr. Armstrong, in that section of the autobiography that I paraphrased, he, he said that there, there were people over the years that would often come up to him and ask him, well, what is the, the secret? I mean, why has this, this work been so full of all these, these activities that have gone right around the world? What is it that makes the work tick? And of course, it was the, the Spirit of God. It was the fact that it was God's work. It was the fact that God was, was involved. The living Christ was guiding it. It's because Herbert Armstrong had the mind of Christ. He let the mind of Christ in. As it says in Philippians 2 and verse 5, I want to take you to another well-known verse. This is from Galatians chapter 2, a memory verse that we use on this program often or that we refer to a lot at, uh, at Armstrong College, one that our many students have, uh, have memorized. It says here, I am crucified. This is Paul writing. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In the verse prior to this, Paul says that he, he lived unto God. How did he do that? How did he live or, or dedicate his life to God? Well, by Jesus Christ living in him. He died with Christ. Christ died for him. And so when he repented of sin, he was crucified together with Christ, figuratively. But then he goes on to say, yet I live, but it's not about me. It's Jesus Christ living in me. I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by Christ's own faith. Galatians 5, a few pages over, it talks about faith being a fruit of God's Spirit, a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it says that we have to live in the Spirit. That's what it means to commune with the Spirit or to get to know the Spirit or to fellowship with the Spirit. Let's take you over to another epistle of Paul. This is Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Paul says, To whom God would make known what is the, the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, what's the mystery that God was making known to the Gentiles through Paul and his teachings? Which is Christ in you, the hope, it says, of glory. That's the mystery. That's the mystery that so few on earth today even understand. The fact that Jesus Christ is alive. The fact that Jesus Christ lives. The fact that Christ lives in true Christians. Verse 28 continues and says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ, Christ Jesus. It leads to perfection in Christ. Christ in you, you in Christ. Either way you look at it, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, I know a man in Christ. He was talking about himself. He lived in Christ. Well, we just read it here in Galatians 2 a moment ago. I, yet I live, but, but it's not me. Christ lives in me. I mean, to the Apostle Paul, Jesus Christ was not a dead Savior. Not at all. He didn't see Jesus Christ as a helpless little baby. He saw Him as the living Christ. The Christ who empowered Him. The Christ who made the work alive, who made that work during the 1930s with Mr. Armstrong, who made that work tick, who brought life to that work, who added so much. Let's look over at 2 Corinthians chapter 13 here. This is right at the end of uh, uh, Paul's second epistle to the brethren at Corinth. And he says in uh, chapter 13, verse 3, 
since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but mighty in you. See, that's how we're strong spiritually. That's how we're able to do things like what Herbert Armstrong recorded in his autobiography. If God gets involved, if God is in it, if Jesus Christ lives in us, I mean, there's might, there's power there, not weakness, strength, real strength. It says in verse 4, For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. See, that's how we, we are strong spiritually. If we're just left to ourselves, talk about weakness, we're nothing. We're nothing. And yet we can be filled with this kind of power. And Paul says in verse 5, here's another memory verse. It says, examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Christ, Jesus Christ, is in you, except you be reprobates? You better put yourself to the test, Paul says. Don't you know that Jesus Christ dwells in us? And if he does, then we've got to constantly look at ourselves. We've got to constantly examine ourselves to see if we're passing the test. That's what that word examine there means in verse 5, to test or to scrutinize or to discipline. We've got to constantly be evaluating ourselves to see if we're in the faith, to see if Jesus Christ lives in you. Prove it. Prove it out. Prove it out. And you'll know by the fruits. Matthew 7 says to judge by fruits. Those fruits are listed off in Galatians 5, which I mentioned earlier. But you can see by the fruits that you're producing, if, if Christ really lives, if He's really living in you, let's look at Acts here in conclusion. Acts chapter 11, a couple of verses here. This takes us back to the uh, early ministry of the Apostle Paul and the work that was going on uh, just north of uh, Jerusalem. Uh, up in Antioch, and uh, it says in uh, verse 26, well, we can just skip to the, the uh, last part of the verse there, which says that uh, they were called Christians first in Antioch. This was about 44 AD or so, more than a decade after the, the death and the crucifixion of Christ. And here is this new term coming into man's vocabulary, Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean? If you're called a Christian, what does that mean? Well, this is a, a quote that I found from a book called Paul, The, uh, the All-Around Man. It's an older book written back in, uh, I think, 1909, so it's over 100 years old. But this man, this author here says, Christianity was not a word used by Paul in the earliest designation of the disciples of Jesus as Christians uh, was not friendly, but it was true. And the significance of it, Paul accepted to the full. It says, Paul the Christian was Paul the follower of Christ. That's what it means to be a true Christian. There's a lot of false Christians in the world today, let's be honest. But a true Christian follows Christ. A true Christian follows in his steps. Tries to live the way Jesus lived. It goes on and says, But follower of Christ was a phrase with meaning and body to it. It meant then, and it means now. If it meant then and means anything at all, the union of life, its sin forgiven and its heart purified with God in Christ, with God in Christ in a sense in which he never was in any other. And then it asks there, are we such Christians? Well, that's a good question. Does that describe you? Is that the kind of... Christian we see in the world today? Well, there's only a very few on this earth who are actually following that example. A true Christian is one who follows Christ. You can study Romans 8 on your own time about the Holy Spirit. That whole chapter has a lot, or at least the first half of it has so much to say about the Holy Spirit. That's what makes one a Christian. If that Spirit of God is dwelling in you, and there's certain prerequisites to receiving it, for sure. The Bible spells those out. We've gone, we've gone over this before on other programs. But a Christian is one in whom is dwelling the Spirit of God, the power of God. 
the life of God. And it's by that Spirit that Christ can live in you. Paul said again about himself, I know a man in Christ. He was that man. Christ was living in Paul. One final quote. This is actually from uh, this book, The Last Hour, the book we're offering today. It says, if you want life to get truly exciting, know the Spirit. Get to know it. Get to know the mind of Christ. And the God family will inspire you for eternity. You see, God is a family. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, going back to that verse at the end of 2 Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and communion with the Holy Spirit be with you, Paul said there at the end of that book. Get to know God's Spirit and have the kind of life described, as I just read to you from that brief quote in this wonderful book, The Last Hour by Gerald Flurry. If you don't have a copy of this yet, I think we've only offered this on TV once before. So if you don't have a copy, be sure to contact us today. You can text us, you can go to our website and order it there, or you can call the number on your screen and request a free copy from one of our operators today. Don't forget also to subscribe to The Trumpet Magazine. We send this around the world. We send this all over the world. And it's a powerful, powerful reminder each month of where we are in Bible prophecy. Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.